Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started? We may have a few more people trickle in, um, but I am very excited to be here today uh, for our Lunch and Learn panel about taking and defending expert depositions. We have three amazing panelists, Bridget, Krista, and Bruno, who I am going to let introduce themselves. Um, and our Lunch and Learn is being put on by the YLD and the tort law sections. And I will be monitoring the chat. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat box. Um, I will field them as they come in um, throughout the course of this uh, at any time, feel free to drop them in there. Um, so my name is Judy Conway. I am the current chair of the YLD and I am also on the tort law section council. So I am extra thrilled to have this event today, bringing together uh, all of my ISBA involvement. Um, and I'll be here uh, just kind of moderating and let our expert panelists uh, do the talking. So if you guys wanna start off by introducing yourselves and then I'll start uh, throwing out some questions. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Krista Gumbiner. I am a partner at Dinsmore and Scholl, and I primarily do commercial litigation, um, a lot of insurance coverage work, um, a lot of surety bond work, which kind of leads me into construction litigation, um, but then also a fair amount of white collar government investigations work as well. Hi everybody, my name is Bridget Dignan. I'm the managing partner at the firm Lathro and Dignan. Uh, we represent victims of medical malpractice, construction negligence, uh, wrongful death, uh, sex abuse cases. Um, and I'm also running for third vice president of the Illinois State Bar Association. So if you received an email with your, uh, your code, please vote if you haven't already. My name is Bruno Marasso. I'm a partner at the law firm of Romanuti and Blanding. Like Bridget, we represent people who are injured as a result of somebody else doing something wrong. And I, uh, I particularly focus my practice in uh, motor vehicle crashes and uh, premises liability and things like that. I'm on the YLD and uh, the assembly and the ISBA. So we have a pretty uh, active and uh, very involved group. We also have some uh, very knowledgeable panelists today. So um, I'm going to just start off by asking you guys about the basics. Um, how do you find an expert? How do you uh, engage an expert? I, I can start and field. And if you guys didn't get this, um, obviously I'm on the defense side and I think primarily on the defense side. And then I think Bridget and Bruno are primarily on the plaintiff side. Um, you know, it, it can be different for every case, at least for me. Um, and I think it's going to be something probably different between me and Bridget. Um, you know, we're a full service national law firm. And so kind of the way that I always start when I need an expert is just sending out an email, right? Whether it's to our construction group, our insurance group, um, whoever, um, or firm-wide, um, I will send out an email and just give the give the details looking for and then start the search by seeing if someone has worked with an expert that they really liked. Um, or oftentimes, you know, they'll, they might not give me an expert that they really like, but they'll say, stay away from these people, et cetera. Um, so that's always a really good tool is just to reach out to, and it doesn't even just have to be within your own firm, um, reach out to colleagues um, who are practicing in that particular area and, you know, getting recommendations because there's nothing better than to work with someone who comes highly recommended and that, you know, um, can get the job done. And so I think that is, um, that's always how I start my search for an expert. Um, I always start my search by going on the lawyer port and I do a jury verdict search. And I'll search the expert's name, um, uh, not the expert's name, I'll search the, the area in which I need an expert, whether it be premises liability, whether it be construction negligence, and I'll do some keyword searches um, and see uh, what kind of cases come up and what kind of experts have testified in these cases. Typically, um, depending on your area of uh, medicine or on your area of construction issues, um, the same names tend to pop up, whether it's on the defense side or the plaintiff side. Um, and then I, I print those out and I reach out to the attorneys who've um, disclosed these experts. Uh, also, I'm a part of some groups like Krista is and um, women's groups. I'm part of the Illinois uh, Trial Lawyers. We have a listserv. And so I'll reach out to those various groups as well and, and look for experts um, if needed. Those who aren't familiar with lawyer port, can you kind of explain what that is and how you use it? And, and, and what happens is you pay a, um, a monthly uh, subscription fee and you're able to search 
really anything. And the people over at Lawyer Port are really, really helpful in that um, they'll they'll walk you through any search. You just give them a call. Um, they'll walk you through any search if you're looking for something in particular. Um, and they'll uh, they'll also hold seminars from time to time that'll teach you kind of the tricks of the trade. So. If you don't have lawyer report, I suggest you get lawyer report because I'm not here to, to promote it, but it is such a helpful tool for me. I'm on it a few times a week, um, you know, just to kind of get an idea of what people are, you know, when I'm looking at verdicts and when how much to demand in a case or something along those lines. I can see what the trend is uh, in terms of jury verdicts and settlements because they're both reported on lawyer report and get our better ideas to how to handle my cases. I think the only other, the, the, the way Krista and, and Bridget are describing it is, is the primary way I find an expert too. My my partner, Bhavani Ravindran, does it a little bit differently. It requires a little bit more work, but she has some, some great results with it. And, and what she'll do is she'll try to look outside of litigation experts. And so we represented a young girl who was a victim of sexual abuse and she was a teenage. And so what she did was she started, well, who are the school psychiatrists in the suburban area who might be able to look at all this and, 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 and kind of helped me out and offer opinions. And so she picked three, she interviewed each of them and one person was just off the charts phenomenal. And, that, and that's who she wound up going with. The, the, the bonus to that is you get somebody who's, who has no track record of plaintiff defense and, and, and it really helps uh, obviate bias. The downside to it is, is you're teaching that person how to be an expert uh, and ultimately you're paying for that. You're, you're paying to teach them. It, bonus to that is you get to, to, to say how you know a good way to do it based off your experience but there's pros and cons to that for, if you have an expert heavy practice that that isn't feasible it's 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 best to do what's what's being suggested see who, who are known entities who can work through the materials but I always like that that Bavani did that so I figured I'd share it and you guys are reaching out um, or looking, researching experts is there uh, any way that you guys go about vetting them are there any reasons that you would stay away from them or investigate your own experts and the other side's experts? Um, uh, yeah, I'm happy to kind of jump in. Um, certainly, I, I guess there are a number of ways. I think the vetting process is just kind of naturally part of trying to figure out and how to pick your expert. Um, I know that, and this is sort of similar to, I think what Bridget was doing, um, once I get recommendations, so whether that's from other people in the firm or whether it's, you know, reaching out to state um, groups or, or things like that, um, I always go on Lexis or Westlaw, um, have somebody pull like as many opinions as you can find about them. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're vetting an expert, um, you might even just have them send you, you know, have you, you know, what have you recently testified in, send me any transcripts, things like that. But um, I always like to do my own due diligence and figure out, you know, have they been um, Daubert or, or something like that? So has their testimony been excluded? What is the basis um, for those exclusions? Because sometimes you can have a really great expert and their, their testimony was excluded. If you still want that expert and, and if you like them, um, you kind of figure out how to work around that. Um, but part of the vetting process is really trying to figure out um, you know, it, it goes into like their, their qualifications. Like, are they truly qualified to test to testify about these issues? Um, what is the risk? Like are, you know, are, you're looking at risks of whether or not they're, you're going to be facing motions to exclude. Um, is that something, is it worth fighting for? Are you okay with incurring those costs? If you know, if we put this expert up, like we're absolutely going to be kind of facing, um, this fight on, on these issues. Um, I think in addition to figuring out um, kind of cases that they, they've testified in before, I just like to get a sense for how are they thought of in the industry, um, how, you know, what kind of working relationships do they have, um, and sort of along Bruno's comments, um, depending on the case, and this is not for every case, but a couple of years ago, we were representing a doctor who had been indicted. Um, we really did interview our experts and um, we wanted to interview them because we needed to see kind of what connections they potentially had to the case. Not, not I mean, almost like a conflicts analysis, um, but more so 
how have you ever had run in with these agents before? Have you had run in with um, anybody else in this like particular community? Just trying to figure out um, and really do a lot of homework on what are you, what do you need to know? Um, what's kind of almost like the skeletons in the closet sort of, in addition to are they qualified to testify on these issues and um, you know, will they be a good expert? I think it de it's depending on the case and depending on your resources, I think there are times when you have to kind of do that additional due diligence and, and do that additional homework. Um, and, and I agree with all of what Krista said. And but my, my focus is um, when I hire an expert, the first thing I'm thinking of is that experts on the stand and the defense attorney is getting them to, to, to cross them. And, and I'm thinking that through and how that's going to happen. And so I'm looking at qualifications. Is he going to be, she going to be attacked on um, the knowledge uh, base regarding this particular case? Um, will he or she hold up under cross-examination or uh, change opinions and fold in cross-examination? Um, I'm looking at impeachment as well. So for example, um, uh, one of the first things I ask for is if they testified in federal court, because in federal court, you, we're required to um, list all of the cases in which you served as an expert. Um, I like to see how often they testify for plaintiffs and defendants, and, and I usually like to get half and half instead of 90-10%, um, just so that that is not something that, although, you know, there's contrary uh, opinions as to whether a jury really picks up on that, I just try to avoid all that. Um, and I read the CV and I read the publications. I want to make sure that this particular expert has not published on something that's contrary to what his opinions will be in my case. Hold on, sorry. I, I guess the only thing I would add is, is you know, it's, if you can do it in a way that is, is not aggressive so as to sour a potential relationship, you know, go ahead and cross-examining them then and there in a, in a first or second interview or call. It isn't a bad idea. And, you know, there's there, there, there's a tact to it that sometimes perhaps I lack. But but the, the, the reality is a lot of the experts charge exorbitant fees. You know, they, it could be four fifty five hundred dollars an hour to, to, you know, to review what you typed out in Discovery Answers two years ago. And, and it's so what usually what I'll try to tell them is, is, is look, there's, you know, is the issues in our case, as you're probably gathering, are A, B, and C. Uh, are you vulnerable? Have you, have you tested? Have you testified under uh, circumstances and, and within this world, and, and come out on the other side? Because I'd like to know that now before before my client invests tens of thousands of dollars into into an expert. And it's it's, it's one of the reasons why you know it, it's certainly in Cook County for the past two years we, we've been we've been entering these these. Supreme Court Rule 218 case management orders that sets forth the life of your case. And it's, you got to watch, I mean, it's obvious, but you have to watch those 213 F3 deadlines because you want to start this process as early as possible. This way you have, you have that, you have that wiggle room to, to uh, investigate and find out if you're hiring the right person or not. There's, you know, tons of people who can help you on any given issue that you're looking for an expert on. And, um, it's important to weed out who's pitching you something because they need the money and they have the time. And, and who, and who, you know, the kind you like to see the people who tell you, I'm not going to be right for you. I'm too vulnerable on these issues based off of prior testimony. Some people will give you that. It's awesome when they do, but other times you got to try it out. Of when you're working with an expert, you don't have the same attorney client privilege that you do with your actual client. So what are some of the considerations about what is discoverable um, and what are some of your methods to kind of track or, um, maintain all of that? Um, yeah, so I think it, it really depends on whether you're in federal or state court. Um, so I think you have to be really sensitive to um, that, that difference. Federal court has, um, particularly in light of the 2010 amendments, I think, um, has a much um, broader protection, though you still have to be careful. Um, and so I'm probably going to get most of this wrong, but in federal court, you can, you can do a lot and keep a lot protected. So um, if something is considered like a draft report in federal court, you can keep it protected, um, but it has to be like a draft report. It can't, you know, there's, there's case law that if it's a 
draft letter or if it's notes or something like that, then that's not protected. So the way that, and then, you know, in, in Illinois state court, you have much less protection. Um, and, and so the way that I generally approach protection and privilege in general with an expert um, is that we don't have much. And so you, I try to be very careful from the very beginning. Um, and so I, of times um, before I want a draft report or anything like that, I spend a lot of time on the phone with the expert. I spend a lot of time on Zoom screen sharing um, because, you know, and, and there are a lot of, I think, workarounds in terms of how to make sure that those communications or those, the exchange of the reports are, are privileged or protected. But um, I think you kind of have to go into it, especially if you're in state court, you kind of go into it knowing that communications are, are going to be, have to, you know, going to be discoverable once um, you flip that testifying expert designation, right? So if you have like a consulting expert, all of that stuff can remain privileged. But if you disclose your consulting expert as a testifying expert, then you're losing all of that privilege. Um, and so yeah, I think I I do a lot of phone calls, um, a lot of, like I said, a lot of like screen sharing to talk, you know, toss around ideas. Um, and in the pre-COVID days, but even now, um, a lot of in-person meetings, right? I, you know, we had a case that led into COVID. It was a really big construction case. Um, and I don't think I saw a draft report from the expert until we had met in person probably three or four times, like in the conference room, looking at the documents, um, going over things, but not ever really exchanging those communications, not circulating any of those draft reports. Um, so those are, I guess, those are the ways that I, I try to prevent um, opposing counsel from, from getting, um, you know, from being able to discover too much of, of what our expert is doing. And, and again, there's going to be that distinction between the, the federal rules and the state rules, which I'm happy to get into a little bit more detail, but um, you know, Bridget, Bruno, if, if you want to jump in. Well, you know, I assume I operate under the assumption that everything is discoverable. So everything is by phone. My expert file is usually papered with um, memos to myself about conversations that we had um, and, and just strategy going forward. You know, it, most of us hire an expert if we are going to have an expert prior to even filing the case. So it's important to track all of that um, with undiscoverable things like notes to yourself, et cetera, and not necessarily correspondence and um, draft reports and, and things of that nature if you're in state court. Um, and so when I'm preparing thing, a uh, certificate of merit or if I'm preparing expert disclosures as well, um, I will uh, do it simultaneously speaking with the expert um, and making sure that uh, what I'm typing out is his or her words and opinions and, and make sure that they're, um, you know, confident on that. I also use disclosure requirements to my advantage in that when you hire experts before filing the case, it's three, four years before you're going to disclose the expert and you have to disclose, you know, how much you paid the expert, et cetera. Sometimes you've staff turnover. So I want to make sure that I'm able to disclose all of that um, and so just make sure that you send correspondence with your payments and make sure that whatever, you know, anything of that nature that you'll have to disclose, um, that you have a file that, uh, you know, is easily accessible so that you're not digging in your secretary's email from three years prior who since left the firm, um, whether you sent that expert a check or not and things like that. So um, use it to your advantage as well to keep organized at the time when you have to disclose or produce all that information. I, I think that uh, uh, Krista and Bridget could certainly handle how to handle, you know, keeping things you want kept to yourself. Well, I think the only thing I would add is, is even in handling the conversations, there, there there's an art that that one develops. I, I was horrible at it my first two or three years of practice, and and you find yourself in situations where the defense attorney asks, "Well, what did Bruno ask you about this?" and your expert just gurgles it back up if you just talk to him before the death and it, it could be embarrassing, but like, like anything else, you get better at it. And like anything else as a lawyer, you frame that conversation with an expert the same way you would frame something if you're trying to appeal to a jury or you're trying to get something from an adverse witness in the death. And so, you know, if, if I have a concern of the case, it's probably something my opponent has shoved down my throat. And so, you know, early on or, or in, 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 
preparing for the report or preparing for a debt, I'll, the way I'll tend to frame it for an expert is I'll say, look, my, 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 the defense attorney the other day pulled me aside and said, Bruno, how does it think you win when your facts are X, Y, and Z? Is he right or is he wrong? And by then, you know, they're, they're deep into the case or they'll tell you early on that they agree with it and you cut and run. But if, if, if it's a deeply entrenched belief by that point, if they're 13, 14, 15 hours into their review, they're going to be as committed to it as, 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 as an advocate as you are on behalf of your client. They're going to say they're wrong because of this thing. And then, you know, when they're, when they're sitting for their death and your, your opponent asks, well, what, what, did, what, what did the guy who retained you or, 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 or the attorney who retained you tell you about this death? They'll say, you know, they raised the point you made about this or that, and here's why you're wrong. And, and it, you can get good testimony that, that, that comes off and, and flips it on its head. So, you know, even though, and most experts are savvy enough where if, if you're not great at it, they'll, they'll, they'll massage it and protect you and keep the substance of an answer, of course, truthful. Um, but, but the idea, even those conversations, at least in state court for sure, your opponent's going to get to ask about them and make it easy on your expert. You know, take, take your time to frame what, what you're curious about in a way so that if he just regurgitates it out, uh, you know, it, it's not harmful to you or and it's not harmful to how he formed his opinions. I think those are um, really helpful ideas. I know I personally like to keep a file on every expert in each of my cases and kind of save emails or documents or whatever in there as necessary. So when I have to turn over the whole file, it's already kind of saved there, but um, that'll change based on obviously your software and kind of your um thoughts, but um, it is very important to get your staff on board with that and realize that that's all included too, um, especially with uh, turnovers, Bridget mentioned. Um, since you guys just brought up the disclosures, can you talk to me and all of us a little bit about um, any considerations for your expert disclosures, um, any issues that might arise from them, and then if you're able to amend them and how that process works? I'm happy to go first, but also I feel like Bruno always gets the shaft. So if Bruno wants to go first. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. I, and I can be brief. You know, one of the things that I've seen a lot of trial judges in Cook County be doing lately is when you draw a 213 F3 disclosure objection at trial, they'll call it the 10 second. And, and they'll, 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 that you'll have 10 seconds to pull out your F3 disclosure and say where it is. And that could be job if like the way I used to do them, you just have page after page and paragraph after paragraph. And so uh, one of uh, the senior partners at our firm, Joe Polar, taught me to get in the habit of, no, 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 this this, this is out. You know, you do Roman numerals, you, you letter or number your paragraphs and you do it in a way that's consistent. This way, if, if it's not an evidence guy, and you're, it probably isn't if it's a retained expert and you're in the courtroom and you draw an F3 objection and one of the judges say, counsel 10 seconds or however they're going to word it, you have your disclosure, you know where it is, and you could say uh, subsection three, paragraph B, it's right there. Everybody has it in it, and if it's there, you're, you're good. So, I mean, I mean, to, to, to just say be organized is, is, is not helpful, but to, to tie it to that example of be ready to have it ready in 10 seconds, I, I, it really, that taught me something. I learned that that trend was growing, and it's led to better disclosure. I mean, it, it, lead, it leads you to draft it. Yeah, and I'll add to that, um, I do the same, I do a roadmap, um, and that's good advice to, to number it because um, it, it's a roadmap for myself and for my, for my expert. Um, some people prefer to just do bare bones and, and rely on a deposition to get additional testimony out. I'm not personally comfortable with that, um, but that's how some people choose to proceed. The one thing I would note, um, and I think this is kind of a trap, um, for both sides is that um, if you, you know, with the plaintiff, we go first, well, actually it's for the plaintiff. So the plaintiff, we go first. And um, it's, it's important that when the defense discloses their um, opinions and then the deposition proceeds that you send something to your opponent that says that your expert reviewed those things. Um, because if they didn't, if you don't disclose the fact that your expert reviewed um, items that uh, were produced after his or her deposition, uh, your expert can be barred from testifying to those things. So um, it's, I just send a letter uh, to my opponent and say, um, just advising that my, my expert reviewed these, you know, the disclosures and the deposition and we'll be providing testimony on that. So it's as simple as that. Yeah, and just to briefly, um, something that Bridget just mentioned, um, 
I've seen that play out um, on the defense side and she's absolutely right. It's something that we use. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a tool and I've pushed very hard on it before. Um, I got into last year, we were just kind of in a, in a huge fight that led up to trial. And ultimately the plaintiff's um, expert was barred from testifying on certain things. It was uh, essentially um, a, we were representing a, like a, a physician group um, and they had kind of kept different medical records that um, were part of, were part of discovery, but, and that we had produced, but it was in like a 50,000 document discovery and what their expert had said that he relied on and what he had testified to um, did not include some of the stuff that like we later found and had disclosed. And so, um, you know, our expert offered testimony on it, but at trial, when their expert tried to testify on it, um, we, we really objected on, on a lot of those, a lot of those medical records. So, um, I think that's a really good practice on the plaintiff side. Um, and it, it's just something even on defense side, just make sure that you are being thorough when it comes to what your expert relied on, how, you know, the basis for your expert forming those opinions, um, because otherwise you will run into trouble um, because the other side will object to, you know, to your expert testifying on anything that you have not previously disclosed. And, and I think especially because so many cases become battles of the expert, um, you really have to be prepared to have your expert be kind of that star witness that's going to um, get your case across the finish line. You guys, um, well, are you able to supplement or amend your expert disclosure? Um, and can you talk about the different ways? Uh, if so, um, it depends. <laughs> That's the easy answer. You know, it depends where you are in your case. Um, I've amended my disclosures just to clean them up after my uh, experts' depositions. Um, sometimes they'll retract some opinions, sometimes they'll clarify. And so I just want those disclosures to, to mirror what the expert's going to testify at trial. So there's not issues with impeachment, et cetera. So I'll do that from time to time. Um, supplement, it just depends on the timeline, um, where you are in your case and if the judge allows it and, and how necessary. Always ask for a rebuttal time for, you know, the opportunity to disclose a rebuttal witness. You want to make sure that if there are new opinions that are disclosed in and or testified to in your defense experts deposition that you're able to respond to those. So just be cognizant of your judge and your timeline. That's the advice I would give on that. Yeah, and kind of to that same point, um, I've fallen into this trap in federal court before. Um, it depends on how the judge's kind of case management um, deadlines are set up. And especially because the parties often in federal court put together the, the proposed plan and then submit it to the judge and often the judge will just adopt it. Um, if you don't, you know, a lot of times it will be plaintiff's disclosures, uh, defense disclosures, rebuttals or, or whatever. Um, but I, what I like to do is um, instead of differentiating that way is do it, um, disclosures on affirmative, like anything that you bear the burden of proof on, and then disclosures sort of on defenses or like rebuttal, and then you can have additional time. Because um, if you have a counterclaim or if you bear the burden on like a certain affirmative defense or something like that, um, you can kind of, like the plaintiff um, might screw themselves out of the opportunity to rebut or, or something like that, depending on your timeline. Um, so yeah, just to Bridget's point, make sure that you're giving yourself enough time um, to, to really understand the, uh, the other experts report, to have your expert, like read their deposition, understand what they were saying. And then, you know, if you need to put together a rebuttal, um, or anything like that. Um, so you really need to build in that time because it, it kind of just depends on what judge you're in front of and what your relationship with is the, with the opposing party is. But if you miss those deadlines, you miss those deadlines. And, if you don't have a good relationship with opposing counsel, or if you're in front of Judge Tharp in the Northern District, you're not, you're getting no relief. Like you, you know, you have missed your deadline. So yeah, that's what I would add. If you could, and, sorry, go ahead, Bruno. Sorry, I actually have nothing to add. That was everything I could say. If, if much <laughs> Okay, well, maybe I'll start with you on this one then. Um, if you're preparing or you're presenting the witness, it's your expert, how do you go about preparing them? How many 
meetings do you need? How long are those meetings lasting? What kind of documents are you giving them? So, so I, I talk to my experts a ton. Um, and you know, it's, it's the, the, the hope is by the time that their deposition is coming around, they, they've heard so much from me that they don't really need a hell of a lot of crap. Um, and, you know, I, I'd say at a minimum, one week before at this, at this stage in, our, in all of our practices, a Zoom conference is necessary. And um, at, at that point, I'm, I'm going to hit them with the absolute hardest question and uh, just remind them that they've had a lot of opportunities on this case to, to, to let me know their thoughts. They've reviewed everything. And, you know, if they have any drastic changes from their opinions to, to, to let me know. Um, but, but otherwise, the expectation is that they're, you know, they're going to be prepared and that they're going to be able to uh, uh, justify their opinions. Um, starting off, obviously, we all know the facts of our case way better than the experts who know the, uh, the science or the medicine or, or, the, or the whatever behind it. But the, the, the hope is that you've done so much groundwork to them to that point that you're not needing to babysit them through that. Now, now, now having said that, I, there, there's, a, there's a billing expert that a lot of plaintiffs use and he's, he, he's great. And before his deposition, I, I, I kind of thought it might just be wind up and go, but we met two hours beforehand. And I reminded him, you know, the specific reasons why we had hired him and, you know, the, the questions that were asked in uh, the bill keeper's depositions that, that, that basically forecasted what the arguments were gonna be at trial. And uh, I reminded him what it was in his report and what we talked about it. And, and I laughed because he goes, you'd be surprised how few people actually take this time and do it and just expect me to know everything and now. And I was like, oh, well, I'm glad I did it. Cause I mean, that, that could go either way, but um, highlighting the key issues um, and just really hoping that they're gonna follow the, the report is, is the best I could say. Yeah, and, and I would say that that's been my experience as well. Um, there is no expert that knows the, the facts better than I do in my cases. And I assume the same to be true for my opponent. Um, so I make sure that my, we talk about the facts. I make sure that my expert is knowledgeable about the facts going in, um, any and all relevant facts he or she needs to know. Also, I always, um, once I just, before I disclose the expert, I, I want to make sure that I provide him or her with everything and not just bits and pieces of things, not some depositions um, and others, because, you know, there are some things that, and, and I give him a copy of the opinions um, that I've typed out that he or she has provided me with, because some of those questions that we all see in these expert depositions, it's just the first time doctor that you've seen your opinions. Yes, it is. Is this the, you know, I noticed that you didn't uh, review uh, this fact witness deposition that has nothing to do with your, you know, the opinions, but then the doctor's like, no, I didn't. I wasn't given that deposition. And all of a sudden he or she is a little shaken, you know, because you didn't give them everything. And that trust is starting to kind of, um, you know, be challenged a little bit by, by your opponent. Um, and so I, I give them everything and I tell them, you don't have to read these things, but just so you know, this is a summary of what this person testified, not relevant to your testimony, but you have it just in case you're asked about it. And so th those are some things that I, I remind him or her that we've provided all this information. Here are your opinions. Here's the roadmap of what we've disclosed or what we provided to you to, to um, review prior to your opinions so that you have all this in front of you. Um, just so that he or she is not shaken by these types of questions. Yeah, and I, I don't have much to add. I, I think that was all very well said. Um, I, I do, and, and it depends on the size of the case, kind of how much prep work you need to do with your expert. Um, and it kind of depends on what's at stake, what, what's at stake, things like that. Um, I tend to spend a lot of time with my experts preparing them. Um, but in addition to all of that, the other thing that I do is just tell them about the personalities that are going to be there. I think it's just important for them to um, know kind of what type of expert deposition this is going to be. A lot of times they've, they've done it a ton, they've been deposed, they, they kind of know the rules of the road. But if I think, you know, this opposing counsel is just extremely aggressive and actually just last week we were in a huge fight over something and he's just going to be out for blood then, you know, just, just prep your expert, make sure that they know um, if things like that are going to happen. Or if, you know, we have a very amicable relationship and 
or just trying to get to a resolution and get through the expert depths. I, I think that's all important for them to know so they're not walking into any particular situation completely cold as to um, kind of what the emotions or what the personality of, of the attorneys on both sides are. Uh, so now I want to switch gears and ask you guys a little bit about when you're actually taking the expert deposition. Um, can you talk about, you know, how you prepare for examining an expert witness um, and kind of how you decide on what goes into your questioning? Yeah, I, I can start out with this one. Um, I think that it, it kind of depends on how you approach the, the purpose of the deposition. I approach it, and, and I think a lot of people do, is I want to know everything. <laughs> I want to know everything they are ever going to possibly say on the stand, right? I mean, that's kind of what the purpose of any deposition is. Um, but I don't, it's not necessarily that I think I have a smoking gun or that I'm looking for any one thing. I'm actually just, I, I want to know everything they're going to say. And um, in, in the outline, Judy had a, had a comment about, you know, do you, do you do the smoking gun of the deposition? Do you hold it for trial? I guess it, it depends on what that is. But for me, I want to know how they're going to respond to it. And I think, you know, you never really want to ask a question at trial that you don't know the answer to. And so for me, um, and again, some strategy goes into this, but for me, I want to know what they're going to say about it, right? If it's just a really bad document or if it's a really bad opinion or something like that, I want to know how they're going to explain it away. Um, because you can, I mean, you can still force them to do that at trial, right? If you put them on the stand. Um, but I just want to know like what that response is. And um, so I, I go into a deposition wanting to know the entire, you know, the entire story. Um, I, my exhibits for taking an expert's deposition are really going to focus on everything they've given me, right? Like it's going to focus on their report and we're going to go through um, kind of point by point um, what they're saying in their report. Um, I'm going to just try to tease out as much as possible any um, inconsistencies in their report, um, any weak points. Um, as I'm preparing for it, I'm preparing with my expert, right? So I'm a lot of times I will um, have whether it's a phone call or it's a video conference, whatever, um, I spend a few hours with my experts saying, you know, give me questions, like, let's walk through this. How should I attack them um, on this issue? How should I attack them on, on, you know, that issue? Because your expert is really the subject, they're the subject matter expert on it, right? And so um, I utilize my own expert when I am preparing to take um, the deposition of, of the other expert. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, with regard to exhibits, it's, it's their report, um, it's potentially their past, you know, testimony, um, it's, you know, documents that they've relied on, and then really anything that my expert says, no, 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 this is what they say in their report, but show them, you know, this photograph of this roof, they didn't talk about that in their report, show it to them and, and you know, say, see what they have to say about it. So um, that's kind of it. And I, I don't go into an expert deposition, I guess, thinking um, how, you know, how am I going to completely destroy this expert? It really is just like a, a discovery, um, like journey for me. I'm just trying to figure out everything um, that we need to know. And of course you attack, you know, you do your work and you attack their credentials and, and you try to like get into all of that um, because you're also going to be after the deposition potentially um, moving to exclude them or, or something like that. So you want to get, if, if you think you're going to move to exclude that expert, you want to be prepared to tease out that testimony um, during their deposition. So you can, you know, you can use it in your Dauber or, or whatever motion. Um, so, so I agree with all that. Um, uh, I think it's also uh, important to know your style and what you're comfortable with as well. So my favorite thing about being an attorney is disclosing defense experts. It's my favorite thing. And, and so I, you know, I'm there to do a couple of things. I'm there to lock them in. Um, I do it again. I know the facts better than the expert does. Um, we as attorneys all know our cases better than these experts because we've been in them for years. And so I'm, I'm using hypotheticals that are going to benefit me and my client um, at, you know, at trial, I'm locking in disagreements 
between the defendants and the experts, for example. And just by experience, you learn what type of agreements you're going to find, like on an informed consent case. You're never going to find an expert that's going to say it's not the standard of care to document certain things, right? Um, but if you have an informed consent case, obviously your defendant didn't document or disclose certain things. Um, and so that's that's an agreement that you're going to be able to um, you know, talk about without it having been disclosed by the defendant. So you just learn that kind of stuff by, um, by virtue of having handled these cases. Um, smoking guns, um, I'll, I'll use them in kind of a roundabout way in that, for example, just to give an example of what I've done, um, you know, I go through all of the um, publications of the experts before I depose them. And sometimes I'll find some pieces in there that support my theory of the case or the medicine that were, you know, et cetera. And so I'll ask the, the doctor, do you agree or do you disagree with this statement? Well, they published it, you know, they usually agree with it. I didn't say that I got it from their own publication. That's for trial time. And so that if that case would have went to trial, which it didn't, I would have brought that out at that time. So that's technically a smoking gun. And um, I am not confrontational ever at any of these. In fact, one time, one of the experts said, you know, you're the, one of the nicest attorneys I've ever met, even nicer than th this defense attorney. Um, I'm, you know, I, I just don't think you get much from an expert if you're just attacking them or her. You know, I think if you're, you're nice and you're, you're, you're reasonable in that your position of the case, um, your theory of the case is, is reasonable, they're going to go along with a lot more than if you are um, trying to jump down their throat. Um, so that's, that's just my style and what I'm comfortable with. I think that the, the only thing I can really add is, and, and I'm worried this is going to sound trite and obvious, but in, in a lot of the cases I bring in the trial and, and getting experts on, there are huge questions. Meaning, yes, we understand our facts, but there's, it can go both ways based off of different testimony and different things being said. And so one of the things that I, I find enjoyable to do, but I also think it's necessary sort of as, as Kristen was saying, like in the discovery phases, is I'll ask, when you reached your opinions, and yes, I'm cheating based off an old outline, when you reached your opinions, what was your understanding of whether uh, A was true or B? And, you know, they'll usually tell you, well, I think it's A. And, and right there, they have a huge problem because they're not there to, to, to decide facts. They're not there to weigh testimony. And, and sometimes you can, you, you can play that out and you can say, well, in, 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 in making that conclusion that A is true, did, did you assume that, that, that witness Marasso was lying? And if you get a yes to that, you have a huge possibility of getting that opinion bar because they, they've overstepped what, what their problem is. Um, they've invaded the problem of the jury. And so it's, 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 I don't like, I never feel like I can beat anybody on expertise. I'm never going to beat anybody on medicine. It's, it's, it's going to be the facts and the record. And, you know, the, the, the threshold question is when I, when, and I agree, it's, it's, it's not something that you even know the answer to going into it, but it's, am I taking this deposition to, to, to nail this expert and, and, and position for settlement or, or am I holding back because I know he's going to give me A, B, and C and I'd rather just do it at trial as opposed to doing it here and then, you know, this great defense attorney can massage it later. And it's, it's I kind of save those questions for the end um, because there, there are expert depositions where you, it's rare, but you can get them to realize that they have real problems with the case that they've signed on to. And that if you, you're in your final, you know, you've been beating them up for three hours, you might get a, yeah, you know, yeah, I see that. Um, but even still, most people will understand, I'm not going to be doing this again. If I give that concession, I'm going to have to find a way to wiggle out of it. So it's, uh, I'll admit, I, I, I generally leave very little on the table. I, 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 if I'm going to get the bad answer, I'd rather know so I can probe. And if I get the good answer, I hopefully I formed it in a way where there's there's going to have little little wiggle room to later on in trial, which is why you know, I'm I'm sure Krista and Bridget are probably far enough along where you're not writing out every question to depositions for expert depositions. I I get pretty close to it, and on those questions where it's do I ask, do I not ask, if it's worded, we, if I'm really happy with how I word it, I'll probably go. For it. Um, because if, if it's if it's an airtight question, they're going to be locked into their answer anyway. So it's, but yeah, there's like a lot of this no one size fits all approach to that, to that question. Yeah, 
Yeah, and if I can just add to what you said, Bruno, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have crisp questions. I'm a rambler. And so it's hard for me. I have to write those questions down because I want them worded a certain way and I want to be able to impeach them at trial. So that's what you're looking at. You're looking at how am I going to be able to do that? So crisp, crisp questions are a necessity. Also, always remember, I was given this advice early on, the enemy of good is better. So if you get something good, just move on. Don't try to make it better. All right. So you all mentioned um, kind of your outlines or writing down the questions. Are there certain topics or subject areas that you make sure you're going over with every single witness, no matter what, um, that you know aren't super case specific, or is everything um, inherently going to be fact specific? I, I mean, I'll take the low hanging fruit. I mean, in every single case, you're going over their qualifications, like you're going over their background, their qualifications. What, what yeah, what makes them qualified to say what they're saying? I mean. An expert is, carries a lot of weight, right? Like an expert is um, a really, really important witness. And I know I said this earlier, but a lot of cases come down to battle with the experts. And so if you can, you know, if you can discredit them, even if you don't, even if you can't um, get them excluded, but if you can really undermine their credibility in any way in front of a jury who is already, I mean, juries are just very interested, interesting, and unless you just get a really sophisticated jury, if you're think, if you're, if you are dealing with complex issues, um, it's all going to be about who they sort of trust on the stand when it comes to the expert. Do they think they're being lied to by the expert? And you know, if you can really um, try to paint a picture of the expert not being as qualified as your expert or whatever that is. So in every single deposition, I even if I don't start with it, although I tend to start with it, I review their um, their qualifications. And sometimes if I'm trying to just be a real pain, like we go back to, I don't know, day one of college. Like I wanna know every class they took. I wanna know every class they took at grad school, whatever it is that qualifies them, you know, to talk about this particular topic. Um, and then the other one I would say is, I'm always going to go through their expert report with them. Like I'm always going to have that and use that. Um, in, in the deposition? Um, on expert reports, I'm kind of the opposite. I, I don't, I kind of put that aside. If I have any questions about it, you know, I, I will ask, but usually I only have one or two questions um, about their report. And, um, you know, I, I want to find out other things. Um, and particularly with the, with defense experts, I want to find out when they were retained. So, um, and when they provided their opinions and what information did they have available to them, if any, sometimes, um, you know, when they provided their opinions, sometimes their opinions are provided before they have all the information. So that's something that you can um, discuss at the deposition and at trial. Um, but yeah, the, the qualifications is something that's important. Um, case background, you know, expert testimony background, uh, relationships, if any, uh, pre-existing relationships with the attorneys um, that hired or the firm that hired him or her. Um, those are kind of the standard things that we go through. Um, standard of care, if it's if it's a medical malpractice case, um, you know, and, and the construction cases are a little bit different in that you want to know, um, you know, their background when it comes to um, safety, if they're a safety expert or if they're a forklift expert. I mean, you want to go through that in detail. And, um, and, you know, the standards and the guidelines on which they were educated, um, you know, prior to. So it's, it's somewhat different, but, but somewhat the same in that regard. I, I think the only thing I could add to, to the what they reviewed is also when, uh, you know, and to circle back to, you know, correspondence with experts. I, I'm, I'm a crazy person in my engagement letter with what I include like I, in the Dropbox link, I actually screenshot the PDF titles that set, set forth what's in the documents because I, I want it to be really clear that I provided everything to the expert. And so, it, you know, just because in the disclosures, your opponent says they were provided material A through Z doesn't mean they read them all. And so sometimes you can go through that and get honest answers as to things they skipped or didn't focus on. And then other times you kind of got to test it. 
Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's not going to be fair or persuasive to pull out random quotes, but if there was some case determinative issue that was raised in the depth and you don't think he read it and you ask him if he had that takeaway and he doesn't know, then you know he didn't read it. Um, and then, I, so I, I'm, I am always testing that. And I, I think the only other thing that I, that I always do if I'm taking the depth is terminology. Um, because th th that, that is, is I, I'll, if I think I know what their terminology is and it's helpful for me, and if I'm pulling it from an old report of theirs or transcript or, 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 or article, I'll say, would you agree that the definition of brain spasticity is A, B, and C? And if I get a yes, great. And if I get a no, I'm going to stop leading. And I'm going to say that I need to know your definition of that term. Because one of the things where you can get tripped up later between the testimony you get at a discovery depth and a trial is when you use that term, Mr. Morasso, my understanding had to have been different than yours. And so, I mean, you, you don't want to turn your depth into a you know, three hour definite, you know, dictionary session, but the key terms that are issue in the case, you should focus on and you should do it early. This way you don't get tripped up in that depth or don't get tripped up in trial. Yeah, and I just add, would add that it goes without saying what, what Bruno's point is, always make sure that you discover on um, what documents, what information that the expert relied upon in forming his or her opinion. So, you know, I go through each and every document that was um, disclosed by the defense attorney to the expert and say, what, what from this document assisted you in forming your opinions in this case? Um, just so you get to narrow down what it is that you're really going to be asking the, the, the doctor or the expert. Um, since we're running low on time, I'm just going to um, give you guys like one final question and then I'll let you give any final parting thoughts. But um, since we're kind of now in this hybrid post-COVID almost maybe <laughs> world um, and we've all had plenty of experience now with remote depositions um, and I'm finding at least that a lot of experts are still doing a lot of remote depths. Can you guys talk about some of the um, considerations for an in-person versus a remote depth and if you guys do different things or how to use exhibits appropriately? Yeah, so I have been, yeah, we've been doing remote depositions um, for the past two years now. Um, honestly, my preference is probably still in person. Um, I think, and we haven't really done many or any in person, um, but I think there's really a substitute for sitting across from someone, um, being in the same room as them, just kind of getting a feel for body language and, and um, like establishing that relationship with them. And so my strong preference, especially it, depending on the case and exactly what it is, um, my strong preference is in person, but I think you can be just as effective um, remote as, as kind of we've all seen and as we've all been um, forced to do. Um, I would say that my process for exhibits is not really different, right? Like I prep, whether it's remote or in person, um, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm just as, as prepared if it's remote. Um, and then I sort of, um, it's kind of a toss up for me. And, and again, it depends on the case whether I want to be a nice person and send them the exhibits the day before um, so we can make sure that they access it. Or if I've just really been going at it with opposing counsel, they might get those exhibits 10 minutes before and you know we hope they can access them. And I don't, I don't want them to spend a lot of time knowing what I'm gonna ask them on. That's just, that really just depends on who it is and, and what the case is. For the most part, I'll, if it's, you know, I'll send them the morning of or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really think it, it changes, kind of, it doesn't really change the topics or the questioning or anything like that. It's just that, you know, again, my preference is, is to be in person because I think you are just able to establish that relationship better um, than you can do over, over Zoom. And I would say I always, I produce my, my exhibits um, at least a day ahead of time. Um, just because I hope that they'll do the same, but I've I've gotten some some um, records or, or things dumped on me the day of, and you know the experts there were on Zoom, and and I'm I need an hour break to review these, and that's not my fault. You know I've asked for these things a day before, so and the expert wasn't or the that witness wasn't too happy about that, but um, you know you don't don't complete a deposition unless you fully reviewed um, everything, and so. 
Um, it just depends. I think it's courtesy, you know, to do it before um, if you want the same courtesy. But if there's a weird relationship, sometimes, um, you know, that's how you handle it. Um, I would say that I want to do mine live still. I've done them via Zoom. Um, I've presented my experts via Zoom, but I make sure I go out and meet my experts in person beforehand. Um, it's important that they, he and I, or she and I sit down at a table and go through the documents. Um, but I, I just don't love Zoom for experts because if there's a delay, it totally messes with my stride. <laughs> so that's just my comment on it. I, uh, I have nothing to add. Well, with that, if you guys have um, any final or parting thoughts, we had no questions in the chat. Um, so if you guys have any um, final tips, tricks, or just comments you want to leave, um, then I will let you all sign up. I'll start. Um, I would say um, before you take an expert, get as many deposition transfers of that, of that expert as you can, read them. Um, and know what you're getting into. Make sure that your ans answers or your questions are um, crisp so that you can impeach. And always think about when you are uh, deposing an expert, that expert being on the stand and how that's gonna play out. And that will help you kind of guide and make your roadmap as to your deposition. Um, just, that's all amazing. And, and I don't have much to add. Um, one thing though is, and we didn't cover this, but it was on the outline as cost. Um, I've gotten into trouble before when I've hired an expert who costs so much more than everybody else or than comp, like comparable rates. And they have just gotten hammered on that, um, whether at the deposition or at, at trial, really it's been at trial. Um, so cost kind of matters. Um, just, keep, you know, yes, you want the best expert, but if they're a thousand dollars above where every other expert is coming in, you are going to be subject to um, you're just paying them to say whatever you want to say. And that plays fairly well in front of a jury. So just keep that in mind. I, I think the last thing I would add is I don't think we got to it. it, it I think it was alluded to by, by each of us, but it's also a determination whether to even take a deposition of a disclosed expert. And, and it's, it, we, I usually err on the side of doing it, but, but sometimes you get a report and it's, it's, it's fundamentally lacking in disclosing bases or the opinions are not sharp and there's little room for logical corollaries, which is sort of the, the state court standard for where you get to expand on. And it's, it's, it's a scary decision to forego it. So, because like, like, I, like Krista and Bridget have been saying, we're there to listen and see what they're gonna say. And it, to, to, to forego that could, could be scary. And it's not a decision to make lightly, but sometimes that report can hang your opponent. And, and um, I wouldn't make that decision alone. I'd run it by somebody, but it's, it's, it, it is a decision that can be made. And then, and then if your opponent is scared because they realize their report sucks and they notice up the depth themselves, you know, you may want to fight that, how that plays out. Like most things depend on your judge. Well, thank you guys so much for your time today. We covered so much and um, I know I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did too. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy.